Good morning, boys and New Hope Church. I hope this message finds you all well. I hope you've all had a great day and a great week. Hope you've been able to uh, stay cool and hopefully stay out of the smoke here in the valley a little bit. Uh, last week uh, we looked at Genesis chapter twenty-nine. I'm sorry, chapter thirty, and we looked at the uh, birth of the eleven sons of Jacob plus his daughter. At least that's who was recorded in that chapter. We saw Le- Leah and Rachel trying to one up each other as far as being that favorite wild, uh, favorite spouse and uh, trying to secure their legacy with Jacob. And then we also saw Jacob begin his separation from Laban with his uh, breeding of the goats and the sheep and Jacob kind of building his flock that way. And this we're going to see kind of the outcome of uh, Jacob's breeding program and what that does for him and his family and his relationship with Laban as well. And so we're going to start off here in chapter 31 today. I'm going to start off reading verses 1 through 21 uh, to get us started here. It says this, says, Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth uh, from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come to the fields where his flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude towards me is not what it has been before. But the God of my father has been with me. You know, I've worked for your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. If he said the speckled ones will be your wages and the floss gave birth to speckled young. If he said the straight ones will be your wages and the floss bore straight young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. In breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, or spotted. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, Here I am. He said to me, Look up and see all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, or spotted. For I have seen that Laban has been, seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, where he made the vow to me. Now leave this land, this land at once and go back to your native land. And Rachel and Leah replied, Do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he also used up what we paid for. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belonged to us and our children. So you do whatever God has told you. And Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him along with the goods he accompanied, he accumulated and patterned a ram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Armenian, by not telling him he was running away. And so he fled with all he had, and crossing the river, he headed for the hill country of Gilead. So stop there for a moment. That's through verse uh, 21. And in the beginning here, we have Laban's sons, Starting to notice that uh, Jacob's getting all the stuff his father used to, their father used to have, um, and so Jacob has been so successful, he's been blessed so much in this in this breeding program that everything Laban has had been transferred to Jacob. So in short, their son, these sons are complaining to the father that basically their brother-in-law is being too successful, and they want him out of the family business. And Laban then probably looks at his accounts and says, "Well, that's actually true." And so his attitude towards Jacob changes, likely trying to adjust Jacob's wages. So Laban comes out on top and Jacob does not anymore. And so there's a lot of family drama happening here and really throughout this chapter. Uh, But God tells Jacob to gather what he owns and return to the land of Canaan, where at last Jacob knew his brother wanted to kill him. And so there's a whole frying pan fire situation happening here that makes Jacob's position pretty precarious. Um, and so when he approaches his wives, Rachel and Leah, and says, hey, look, God's told me to go back to Canaan. And they say, well, basically, our bride price is gone. We have no inheritance for the father. We're strangers and foreigners to him now, so we might as well go with you. And so they all pack up their stuff and they head out. And so Jacob is um, really kind of coming to understand that if he stays with Laban, he's going to have nothing but strife and conflict um, with this family that's kind of taken him in the last 20 years. And so he knows that if he goes, he's going to confront his past and confront that strife and conflict with his brother that's from brewing for 20 years as well. And so Jacob's really in quite a difficult situation. If he stays one place, he's got strife. If he goes to another place, he has strife too. And so wherever Jacob goes, he's going to have a problem. 
And he says, no, I'm going to be obedient to God. So he takes his family and he heads out. Doesn't tell Laban he's leaving. He just heads out and heads for the hill country. And so it's in the middle of the situation we want to look at. If you look at me in verse 13, um, we read what God told Jacob. He says, I am the God of Bethel, where he anointed the pillar, where he made a vow to me. Now, you remember that Bethel was back in chapter 28, a few chapters ago, where Jacob had the dream of God's work on earth, huh? the angels ascending and descending from heaven. So Jacob awoke, and surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. But we also have the promise that God gave Jacob in that same place. He said, I will be with you, will watch over wherever you go, and I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until what I have done, I have promised. And so God is reminding Jacob that in the midst of uh, this strife, he is still the same God. Uh, he's blessed Jacob in the, where he's at and over these last 20 years that God has still taken care of him. He's still ensuring Jacob has his inheritance he needs. And so basically Jacob's past, his deceit of his brother and his father, hasn't defined his future. And God is still with Jacob to this day and, will, and is going to take him back to the land of Canaan. And the one last point in this passage I want to point out is that uh, there at the end we read that just that one verse of Rachel stole her father's household gods. And it's a very small line. It's a one line really in the, throughout the Bible. And so we don't have any reasoning for why Rachel would have done that. We can speculate that maybe she was, um, she saw this as her due from her father, her own inheritance, her own dowry to take with her. Maybe that's what she saw. Or maybe she wanted to um, just take something from home, have a remembrance of home with her or maybe she was bitter at her father wanted to teach him a lesson we don't know exactly her motives for this uh, but it's really this theft of the gods and the theft of Laban's children and grandchildren that's running away from him that makes Laban chase after him here in our next passage here and so if we look a little more let's read verses uh, 22 to 35 for the next section here it says, it says on the third day Laban was told that Jacob had fled and taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban the Armenian in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him. And Laban and his relatives camped there too. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You have deceived me and you have carried off my daughters like captives in war. You, why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could... Send you with joy in the singing and the music of tambourines and harps. You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night God, the God of your father, said to me, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you've I'm sorry, now you have gone off because you longed to return to your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Verse 31, Jacob answered Laban, I was afraid because I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. But if you find anyone who has your gods, he shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourself whether there is anything here of yours with me. And if so, take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. So Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two maidservants, but found nothing. After he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods, and put them inside her camel's saddle, and was sitting on them. Label searched through everything in the tent, but found nothing. Rachel said to her father, Don't be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I am having my period. And so he searched, but could not find the household gods. So we'll stop there for a minute. So Laban is caught up with Jacob now after ten days of being gone. And there's this is the beginning of a big uh, familial blow-up between these two. Laban's angry that Jacob left without saying goodbye, without giving him a chance to see his children, his grandchildren, and for stealing those household gods. And Jacob, of course, is a little bit sheepish about running away, but and didn't about the accusation of theft. And so he says, look, Laban, you can search, and whatever you find, bring it out, put it in front of us, so a family can judge between these two men. Laban then searches, he searches Jacob's tent, finds nothing. Searches the maid's tent, doesn't find anything. Searches Leah's tent, doesn't find anything. Gets into Rachel's tent, and she, he doesn't find anything. And so instead of Rachel getting up and letting her father do a thorough search of the saddle and everything else, she says, no, I'm having my monthly menstruation. I can't stand up. So Laban, of course, trusts his daughter. So said, okay, they're not there. And I can just see Laban's expression on his face coming back 
out of the tent with his head down, dragging his feet, kind of shuffling along, thinking, man, now I've got to apologize to him. Kind of chagrined at his behavior. There's nothing to put at Jacob's feet. He can't say, here's the God you stole. Here's what else you stole from my house. And so he doesn't know what to do. And Jacob is going to be very suspect about any apology Laban wants to offer, given his treatment of Jacob in the past, with those changing wages and such. And so here we have kind of the beginning of this tension where Jacob and Laban kind of have this come to a head. All this tension over the last 20 years comes to a head here. And it's not really an apology we see here. It's more just a um, let's agree to disagree or agree to go move beyond this point. And so let's read a little more here and let's read the rest of this chapter, verses 36 to 55. It says, Jacob was angry and took Laban to task. What is, is, what is my crime? He asked Laban. What sin have I committed that you have hunted me down? Now that you have searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine and let them judge between the two of us. I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring your animals torn by wild beasts. And I bore the loss myself. And you demand payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night, and the sheep fled from my eyes. It was like this for 20 years. I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you surely would have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. Laban answered Jacob, the women are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine, yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine, about the children they have borne? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar, and he said to his relatives, gather them some stones. They took stones and piled them in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jacob. Shadutha and Jacob called it Gilead. Gilead, excuse me. Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why it is called Gilead. And it is also called Mizpah, because it said, May the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take any wives beside my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. Laban also said to Jacob, Here in this heap, and here in this pillar I have set up between you and me, this heap is witness, this pillar is witness that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you, and you will not go past this heap and pillar on my side to harm me. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their fathers, judge between us. So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac, and he offered a sacrifice there in the hill country, and invited his relatives to a meal. After they'd eaten, they spent the night there, early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. So this is the uh, apology we have, so to speak, between these two men, right? Um, Jacob here airs all his great experiences against Laban. Why are you treating this way? I've been good to you these last 20 years. What are you doing to me? Um, in other words, Jacob is ready to go his own way. And Laban's still picking on him. He still thinks Laban owns everything. It's basically what Jacob's telling him. Laban basically responds, Look, you took my granddaughters and my children away from me. What was I supposed to do? Neither is really kind of offering an apology for their behavior, but they do desire peace between these two clans. And so Laban suggests making that treaty between Jacob, and Jacob agrees to it in the name of the Lord. He set up this pillar of stone, this pile of stones as a as a boundary line and as a reminder for their respective families. So basically Jacob is promising that he's going to treat Laban's daughters well. He's not going to have any other wives. And he's not going to try and harm Jacob on the other side of this line. And Laban says, I'm not going to go beyond this point to harm you either. And so it's kind of a, a boundary line. And it's a boundary that reminds Jacob of his promise to care for Laban's daughters and his promise to be a good neighbor to Laban and his family. And so they celebrate this with a feast and they make that a covenant. And the next morning, Laban goes back home after he has a chance to bless and kiss his children and grandchildren goodbye. So I don't know about you, but there's a lot of drama in this passage, right? But there's one thing that stands out to me um, really twice in this passage is how God is mentioned. 
The first time when God speaks to Jacob, he reminds Jacob of the covenant God made with him at Bethel. He says, I am the God of Bethel, where you promised that I would be your God if I did these things. And God says, I am doing these things, so I get to be your God, Jacob. So that's the first promise that God makes. And the second time, Laban reminds Jacob that God is constantly watching. God is ever present in the life of Jacob. He will bear witness to Jacob's actions. He will bear witness to Jacob's behaviors. And God will hold him accountable to those things. And so it's really a not so subtle reminder that God will hold us accountable for the promises we make too in our behaviors and actions in his presence. And so God made this promise to Jacob at Bethel and Jacob made a promise to God at Bethel that if God did this, this, and this, Jacob would follow the Lord. And so really this is kind of this reminder that God is holding up to his end of the bargain. Yes, it's been 20 years since Jacob left. It's been 20 years since he deceived his brother and worked for Laban. And so it's been a long time, but God is still holding up his end of the bargain. And so even in our own lives and things take longer than we'd like them to, or God doesn't work in our own timetable. He has not forgotten us. God is still faithful to the promises he makes to us. And thanks be to God that he is. Lord, we thank you for today and this time together. God, thank you for this reminder of your faithfulness. And Lord, as we look through this chapter and we see the, the family drama, sometimes we can relate to that, Lord, in our own families. But God, we're thankful that through the, those those difficult times, those trying times, you are still with us and you are still being faithful to the promises you make to us. And God, we hear nothing but thank you for that promise. Lord, we love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. Uh, next, we'll look at chapter 32. But until that time, remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people.